Good morning, Grace Commons, and welcome to worship, whether you are here in person or online. We're so glad you're here with us. Here are a few things that we would like for you to know about this week. TED officer nominations are happening right now. TED is short for trustee, elder, and deacon. And these are our elected officers, people like you, elected by people like you, to lead our staff and the congregation. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is nudging you to consider one of these critical roles. Or look around. There might be someone that you know that you could nominate for one of these positions. Go to our website for more information in the nomination form. Next, the Grace Commons Marshall Fire Relief Effort continues to support those who have been impacted by the fire. To date, due to your generosity, we have collected over $225,000 and have been able to give out almost half of that to people directly impacted by the fire. If you or someone you know needs assistance, whether physical, financial, and or relational due to the fire, be sure to let us know by visiting our website. Our Boulder Vision Project monthly update is happening next Sunday after each worship service in the chapel. In addition to hearing what's happening with the Annex and the main campus, there will be a time for questions regarding the Ministry Year 2023 budget and the beginning of the pastoral search. Lastly, Holy Week and Easter are coming up in just a couple of weeks. We have these postcards available at the Welcome Center and also in the back of the sanctuary for you to give out to your neighbors and your friends. Please take some and ask God to impress upon your heart who to invite. Now, let us enter into worship together. Good morning, Grace Commons. Welcome. Welcome to you here in the sanctuary. Welcome to you joining us online. Why don't we take a big deep breath in and a big deep breath out after another fire that we had to deal with. Yeah. I'm Diana Maxwell and James and I, my husband, we've been uh, serving together in this church since the early 90s. And this morning I'm pleased to serve as your worship assistant. Please stand as I lead us in our call to worship. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship God.
serve a God who sees us, he knows us, and he desires to hear our confessions because of his great love for us. Please join me in speaking our prayer of confession. Gracious God, you called us in love to be a people who reflect your nature, who are different from those around us, who spend themselves sacrificially and generously for those in need. But too often we hoard your resources, hold back grudgingly, and fail to follow the path of Jesus. O oh Lord, forgive us. Fill us to overflowing with the riches of your grace. Help us to pour out abundantly to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now for a time of silent confession. With gratitude to God, we receive his assurance of pardon. Hear these words of encouragement from Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Please be seated. Well, again, good morning. It's good to be with you all, especially you who are gathering today online. Thanks for joining us. Um, before I begin my sermon, just a couple items I wanted to share with you. Some of you are tracking with my family as we are concerned for my mother who's battling cancer. Uh, last week, Rupali and I got out to see mom and dad, and mom continues to be in a stable holding pattern. She's not in any pain. Uh, the cancer is spreading. It's all over her body, but dad and mom are both in a really good temporary place. So thanks for your concern there. The other item is I want to make sure you all know about uh, Holy Week and what we're offering and be sure that if you can, you are able to join us. Maundy Thursday, uh, we will have a, a celebration of worship and communion in our chapel and uh, it'll be a more contemporary flavor. Joe Cutshall, our music and worship leader, will be giving the message. And if you've heard Joe speak, he's really quite gifted. That's Thursday of Holy Week. And then Friday of Holy Week, the Tenebrae service, 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Um, I'm kind of leading that service. And we're going to be using the Marshall Fire and the fires generally as an entryway into the sufferings of Christ. And so I, I think this is going to be a moving service and a, a special one. And if you have friends or neighbors who've been impacted by the fire, this might be something to invite them to. So please keep that in mind. Well, today we continue in our Lenten sermon series called The Upside Down Kingdom. And our text is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. I'm gonna go through it twice today, but the first time I want you just to hear it. And then in the sermon itself, we'll go through it more carefully. Let's listen to it. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? 
Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, these are not easy words to receive. We pray for the grace of your Holy Spirit to illumine our minds, to open our hearts, to conform us more and more to you and to your image, that we may know life indeed. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, I think it's fairly safe to say that by modern standards, Jesus was not good at sales and marketing. I mean, if you want to win friends and influence people, if you want to start a successful global movement for all people in all places at all times, do you do it the way Jesus did? Start with a questionable pedigree and be born to an unwed mother in a manger in Bethlehem, basically homeless? Begin your childhood as a refugee in Egypt? Grow up in backwater Galilee as a blue-collar worker? Get baptized with a bunch of sinners in the Jordan River to begin your public ministry? Hang out with rejects and shady ladies, touch lepers, welcome outcasts, embrace foreigners, forgive enemies. If you're the Messiah, is this what you do? Speak truth to power and respect, disrespect the religious elite and the Jerusalem politicians? Hire uneducated fishermen to be your senior VPs? Who does this? Then, would you say things like this? Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. Why not bless the rich and those who are rich in spirit? Say things like, blessed, happy are those who mourn. Why not bless the optimistic, the positive thinkers, the upbeat? Say, blessed, happy are the peacemakers. Why not bless the winners who get their way? who destroy the opposition and put themselves first at all costs. But that's not Jesus. Everything Jesus said and did was upside down. Want to gain your life? Lose it. Want to live? Die. Want to be rich in heaven? Give away your stuff on earth. Want to lead? Serve. Want to be first? Be last. You want glory? Suffer. No cross? no crown. Friends, this isn't worldly wisdom, at least not if you want to promote a successful global organization. Jesus' way is so counterintuitive, so contrary to accepted wisdom, self-help books, and social media influencers that maybe, just maybe, it's true. You know, we can't make this stuff up. It is the upside-down kingdom. Several years ago, we had Dale Bruner here at the church. Do you remember that? It was a spiritual formation weekend. Back in the day when I was in charge of that ministry, Dale Bruner came and spoke to us for a weekend. He was working on his Gospel of John commentary, and uh, he electrified us with his teaching. In many ways, Dale Bruner, I think, is probably America's best Bible teacher, and we get to call him our own. He's Presbyterian. uh, He's a great, great writer and thinker. He's written a commentary on our text today, and I want to give full credit to him. Matthew, a commentary, volume two, and it is fabulous. And guess where it is if you don't own it? It's in the church library. (laughs) And I don't know if you've been to the church library recently, but it is fabulous. Janet Schultz, Carol Thompson, and their team, they have done a marvelous job culling out and focusing that library. It is such a useful tool. You need to go check it out. But anyway, in this commentary, I'm going to quote it several times. Bruner says this about what we're talking about. He says, Jesus is the suffering Christ. Oxymoron. Don't the words contradict each other? God's Christ comes, does he not, to end suffering, not endure it. He comes surely to win, not lose. If you were a first century Jew in Palestine at the time of Jesus, you expected the Messiah to be a military political leader, 
to kick out the Roman occupiers, to restore Israel to its former glory, to, uh, to establish God's kingdom on earth. Full stop. But you don't get this with Jesus. You get something else. And that's what we're thinking about today. So what I want to do is go back to our text and unpack it together, make a few more comments. I'll, I'll be your tour guide today and show you a few features that I think are important. So let's go back to uh, Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. From that time on, now that's a cue. Recall what just has happened. We didn't read about it today, but here's what's happened. Jesus went away on a retreat with his disciples to the far north of Israel, to Caesarea Philippi, which was a pagan place. And I've been there, and there are all kinds of idols and statues to pagan gods. They're still there. And it was in this pagan, almost foreign context, Jesus asked a question. He said to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts it out. You, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus affirms him, says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And then he calls him Rocky. Peter means rock. And he says, I'm going to build my church on faith like yours, a rock like you. And so that's just happened. Keep that in mind. And now Jesus takes a twist. Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must, it's part of God's calling on his life, he must go to Jerusalem, Jerusalem where the Messiah is is revealed. He must go to Jerusalem and bombshell suffer suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Listen to how Dale Bruner renders this. That he must uh, suffer many things at the hands of the lay leaders, senior pastors, and Bible teachers. Ouch. And then be killed, which is a mind blower, and on the third day be raised to life. What does this mean? Peter, this is too much for him, so he takes Jesus aside. By the way, that's a good way. If you want to confront someone, don't do it publicly. Take them aside. Take them aside and share your concerns with them. This is what Peter's doing. He doesn't want to shame the Lord. And so he gives us actually a fairly good example of confrontation, but that's about as far as it gets. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. In some translations, it's God forbid. God forbid, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. Literally in Greek, a scandal. It means stumbling stone, literally. And isn't this interesting? Because Peter goes from being the rock on whom the church is to be built to being a stumbling stone. And this reminds us that our our leaders in the church have clay feet. And we know that well. And we, we, we need to accept that and, and work with that. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, and here comes the hard word, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. They would have known about crosses, this implement of torture and death, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And by the way, that's the same word as life. So uh, NIV translates it with a sort of a different context as soul. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul, their life? For the Son of Man, Jesus' self favorite term for himself, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, that's the second coming, And then he will reward each person according to what they've done. So much could be said about that. We don't have time, but but let's continue into verse 28. Truly I tell you, amen, I say to you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And believe me, this is confounded scholars, because as Jesus is saying, you're going to see my full glory in this lifetime, your lifetime, you, my disciples, sure sounds like it. But we know from from history that is not what occurred. So probably Jesus is referring perhaps to the resurrection. You're going to see my resurrection. Either that or the Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit. So that's our text. It's a tough text, isn't it? 
I find that a very challenging text. And I want to ask this question as we reflect on it. Why do we find Jesus' teaching so hard? Why do we find it so hard? Because if you're honest, this is a hard saying of Jesus. What are we going to do with it? Why do we find it so hard? Well, I think it's this. I think it's because suffering and death threaten our instinct toward comfort and life. This impulse toward comfort and life is so deeply hardwired into us that the threat of suffering and death, even for Jesus, is anathema. It's repellent. But we have to remember that Jesus is not a nihilist. Jesus does not have a death wish. Jesus is referring to life, and if we stay with him, even in this text, we see him refer to life. He wants life for us, so there's a certain kind of life he wants us to press through to get to his life. Jesus, after all, said in John chapter 10, verse 10, these famous words, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is actually about life, and so we need to cling to that even as we deal with these tough verses. So this idea of life that he's referring to, the life that we must discard, has to be contrasted to the life that he wants to give us. So let's think for a minute, what kind of life are we to lose for Jesus? I think if you study this in the context of the New Testament, the Gospels and the letters of Paul, we see that what the life Jesus wants us to lose is a life in the flesh. Well, what is the flesh? As someone once said, the flesh is self spelled backward, sort of. <laughs> it's, it's this idea where I am at the center of all things. The life we're to lose is a self-centered life. After all, that's the definition of sin, someone once said. Sin is S-I-N with a capital I in the middle. It's all about me. It's a life where self is God. And if you want a miserable life, at the end of the day, this is the kind of life you will have if this is true of you and me. Peterson, Eugene Peterson in the message makes this really clear. Let's just share his text right here. His translation of our passage goes like this. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. Wow. Once again, Peterson gets right to the point. I've told you this many times uh, in sermons in the past, but um, my sister uh, was trained to be a missionary in Central Asia with her first husband, and um, they had to go through cultural sensitivity training, and they had to begin by understanding our culture, the American culture, and they recognized, they were taught, that there were several things that were true of us as Americans. And as I heard them tell me about this, I realized these are really true about me. And so I want to remind you of what I have come to call the four pillars of the kingdom of Carl. <laughs> also known as the four C's. Uh, these are things that are typical of North American culture, affluent North American culture, and they're certainly true of me, and I suspect maybe some of you. Control. We love to be in control. Comfort. We like comfort for our chairs, the way we live our lives, our commute. We want to be comfortable. Convenience. We like everything convenient and quick. And then certainly cleanliness. We're a largely clean culture. And these things are not necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they can become so dominant in our lives, in my life, that they become idols. And if we're not careful, we can begin to use God as a means to give us more of the four C's. If I, like a genie with a bottle, if I rub God the right way, he'll give me more of the four C's. And I think a lot of people go to church to attain the four C's. But this is not what Jesus is talking about. These things, when they are dominant in our lives, are idols, and they enslave us. Jesus wants to free us. Again, Bruner is so good here. He writes this in his commentary. At the last judgment, some of us will be dumbfounded 
to discover that what we thought was the innocent seeking of good and beautiful things for ourselves and our children, the four C's, was actually a whoring after alien gods and the use of religion to advance our status. Who of us can escape this indictment? Wow. Who of us indeed? Jesus, friends, wants to give us true life, fulfilling, lasting life, a life that will not let us down, a life that endures. Brunner, again, is helpful. Jesus is not anti our life. He is anti-preoccupation with our life. When we turn our backs on our lives, surprise, we receive our lives. This is what we're talking about today. Jesus wants to give us true life, life indeed. Life that is free and fulfilling and fearless. A life that lasts. Because self in the driver's seat only works for so long. Until you get the cancer diagnosis. Until a fire burns your house down. Until you lose a loved one or are fired from your job or something else. So wonder what this says to you. I wonder what it says to me. I would submit that following Jesus is a gamble. Jesus invites us to ante up our life in a wager or a bet that his life is better than ours, that he can give us life, the kind of life we really want. This is, after all, what he says in Matthew 13, a few chapters earlier, when he speaks of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. In other words, it's something so good that a person would trade everything else to make it their own. Jesus continues. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Some of you know the name Jim Elliott. Anybody know the name Jim Elliott? A lot of you do. Jim Elliott was one of the uh, martyrs of Ecuador in the 1950s. A group from Wheaton College uh, were missionaries, and they took the gospel to an unreached tribe called the Alca Indians in Ecuador. And they they, uh, reached out to them in a number of ways over a length of time, and several of them were killed, martyred in that place. And the story is told by Jim's... uh, Jim's uh, widow, Elizabeth Elliot. Here's a picture of Jim Elliot. And he has this famous quote, which is what I think we're talking about. He famously said, he is no fool who cannot, who gives what he cannot keep, that is his so-called life with him at the center, who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. The abiding life of Jesus. This is what we're talking about. And this is what I'm pondering as I think about it in this odd stage I find myself in. Uh, A lot of you know that we, uh, along with many others, lost our home in the Marshall Fire. And there are some questions that I'm asking myself right now, pretty profound ones, I think, for me at least. The Marshall Fire, here are questions I'm asking myself. What has defined my life? When I'm stripped of this, what of my core identity remains? Amidst all these losses, what are the potential gains? Where are the hidden blessings? How might this be a severe mercy? Come to the Good Friday service and there'll be more. We'll talk more about that. But this is what I'm asking, and I suspect I'm not alone among fire survivors. Or for those of you who were affected by the in-car fire yesterday and even early this morning, You're you're forced to evacuate. It's a terrifying, vulnerable feeling. And you're stripped, at least temporarily, of all that you know to find you. Where is your security? Where is mine? Who are we at our core? Events like these make us ask these questions. Well, there's a lot to think about, and I hope you'll think about this more this week. But I want to pray for you as you do. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we are thankful to you that we do, in fact, stand in a steady and stable place despite all that's going on around us. 
We come to worship to reaffirm this, to remind each other of this before you. And we pray that you would give us the courage to trust you with what we've heard today and to step more into this type of life that you want to give us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you, choir. Let us come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we exalt your holy name. We exalt you for loving us with your word, to be a people not satisfied in selfish gain that harms others, or a people content with our own vain worldly pursuits. Jesus, you taught us that your kingdom belongs to those whose character is formed in poverty of spirit, in mourning sin and turning from it, and who place their hope in, not my will, but yours, Father, be done. Gracious God, may our character bear the fruit of blessing others, showing your love to those who ignore you and Jesus' example, 
with a heart toward their reconciliation in you. Heavenly Father, we admit that discipleship is not a comfortable path. It requires bearing our cross, sacrificial love, and turning away from our selfish ways. We give thanks for Jesus' example and for the cloud of witnesses surrounding us. The Holy Spirit's presence and your living word guide us in not serving in our own strength. For only in you are our souls anchored in our true eternal fulfillment. We praise you. Lord, our church continues to grieve much loss. Our community grieves two devastating fires that hurt many and a reminder of a mass shooting with fatalities. Our nation is under the strife of political grappling. Our world is distressed by the evil war against Ukraine. Lord, these threaten our hope in your justice and peace prevailing. God, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. By your grace, set our hearts and minds in thanksgiving and trust to wholly live as your faithful followers in this fallen plagued world. Fortify our souls with the words from the Psalms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. And those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which never, can never be shaken, never be moved. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people now and forever. We pray this in Jesus' name and also the prayer he taught us, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Just have a seat, please. A little update that I want to share. Uh, I don't know how many of you are, are following, as I am quite religiously, uh, March Madness. But if you, if you have been following this little Jesuit college in Jersey City, New Jersey, St. Peter's, to me it's a parable of what we as Grace Commons can be. If you follow that team, they don't have the tall players, they don't have the big athletic budget. Uh, they must have been inspired by another Jesuit school in my adopted hometown, Spokane, called Gonzaga. They think they can go all the way. So I hope you'll watch them this afternoon as they beat the Tar Heels. Uh, <laughs> but what, it, what the message uh, in this stewardship season for me, you could see where this was going, is that every single one of those players is all in. They are all in. And they all get to play. And they need every single one. And that's their whole strategy. Get them all on the floor so that they can win their games. And that's really where we need to be. So thank you so much to each of you who have turned in a commitment card. We are so grateful. We are on pace to exceed last year's number. And that is wonderful. But I have higher hopes. I want to see every single person make a faith commitment, however large or small to support the ministry that God is calling us to in the year ahead. Next week, after both services, as, as we saw in the announcement, as Diana shared, we'll be giving you an update on Ministry Year 23 budget and the plans for that year after both services. I hope you'll take a chance to attend one of those sessions. But God is at work in this church, and I'm just thrilled by the potential for where we can be as we engage in ministry, in Ministry Year 23. So I hope you will support that. It's still not too late to turn in your pledge card. You can, you can do it online, or you can grab a, an extra copy from the welcome desk after church. Well, Carl's going to come now and give us a charge and a benediction, and I hope you'll remain as Uni plays the Ukrainian national anthem as we close in our prelude. Well, we had quite a word from Jesus today, didn't we? It's a challenging word, but I think if it's rightly understood, it's a liberating word. Uh, so I encourage you to go back to it this week, reread it, pray over it, see what the Lord is uh, drawing you into as we adventure with him in faith. Hey, if you've brought a, a need today for yourself or someone else that you know of and would like some prayer, we've got prayer ministers over here ready to pray with you. Please take advantage of them, but always go forth with a blessing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit as all God's people said, Amen. Amen.